Christians agree that we can call Mary the mother of Jesus, but not all Christians agree that we can call Mary the mother of God. Why is that? That's what we're going to talk about on tonight's program. Tonight we're going to talk about one of those distinctively Catholic topics, Mary as the mother of God. But why is that distinctively Catholic, to talk about Mary as the mother of God? It shouldn't be, and yet it oftentimes is. And joining me to have this conversation is Dr. John Seahorn, who is a professor of theology here at the Augusta Institute. John, pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be here, Tim. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You know, and I know one of the great areas of your expertise is the patristics and the early church. And yet you've been doing a little research lately on Marian consecration. So you've been doing some research on Mary. And so I thought it'd be great to have this conversation and bring you in. You know, it, it's true. All Christians pretty much agree that Mary is the mother of Jesus. But if we talk about the title, mother of God, that doesn't get unanimity amongst Christians, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think the first, the first thing to point out just is that that's a title um, mm -hmm. that doesn't appear uh, directly in Scripture. Yeah, that's true. And so, but it's, it's something, it's a title that's really used in the early church, as, as I know you know quite well. Um, and it's something that the, the church had, it ended up engendering a debate. There was a bit of a controversy, but at first, it was kind of accepted that Mary is kind of the mother of God and that we asked for Mary, Mary's intercession and prayers and, you know, see her as an important model, somebody being honored. There's images of Mary in the catacombs. So we're talking pretty early on in the church's practice. Mm -hmm. And yet, this becomes a bit of a controversy. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, well, may, you know, maybe, uh, Tim, the best way to, to approach it is um, just to sort of think almost in terms of a syllogism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, it's very clear in Scripture that Mary is the mother of Jesus. Yeah. It's pretty clear in Scripture, now there was debate about this in the early church about what this meant, but that Jesus is God. So if Mary is the mother of Jesus, and if Jesus is God, then shouldn't we be able to say that Mary is the mother of God? And in fact, as, as you pointed out, in terms mm -hmm. just of kind of spontaneous Christian piety, mm -hmm. um, that equation was made very early on. So um, in fact, the earliest uh, um, uh, prayer to Mary that, that we have outside of Scripture is called the Subtuum Presidium. Yeah. And some people might, might be familiar with it, right? We fly... Uh, to your protection, yep. O Holy Mother of God. And um, yeah. we know that that, that prayer was prayed uh, by Christians in Egypt as early as the third century and maybe even earlier. I, um, I love that prayer, by the way, and it's, it's, it's one I use in my morning prayers because I know how ancient it is, yes, which is just yeah. so beautiful. No, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful prayer. Um, so we have examples of uh, church fathers, theologians uh, even, who are willing to refer to Mary as Mother of God. Uh, from pretty early on. Um, but, you know, uh, the debate actually erupts um, maybe later than pe people might expect. Uh, it's not yeah. till the 5th century, so the yeah. 400s, um, that this, this becomes a big deal. And the question at stake, if you think about it, um, is less directly about Mary than it is about Jesus, although it has very important implications for how mm. we think about Mary. But if we want to understand that mm -hmm. question, we need to start with the question about Jesus. Yeah, let's let's unpack that because I want to I want to go to uh, a character named Nestorius and and the role he plays in this controversy and um, but let's just let's just back it up a little bit and talk about you know what you said Mary as the um, the the mother of Jesus and how that leads us to this Mary as mother of God but before before I have you t start us there I want to ask our audience if you have questions about Mary as the mother of God we'd love for you to join our conversation tonight. So um, please text us at 720-650-0100. Any questions about Mary, but especially as regards to her as the mother of God. And um, <clears throat> we'd love to hear your questions tonight and have that come in. So, so John, why don't you pick up where we left off and, and, and set us up with this conversation about um, this controversy about Mary as the mother of God. Sure. So, um, you know, not actually that long ago, in fact, just last week, we celebrated the feast of St. Athanasius, mm, yep. right? And Athanasius is known as the great defender of the Council of Nicaea and uh, the great champion of the full the divinity, divinity of, Jesus. of Jesus as the eternal Son of God. 
Um, and you know, by the time we get to the Mother of God controversy, um, that now there were there were still people who denied this, but it was largely settled. Okay, and that is not what was at stake. Mm -hmm. The question is not, is Jesus God? Is Christ God um, fully? Is the eternal Son uh, equal with the Father? Mm -hmm. um, everyone in this debate agreed about that. Actually, yeah. the question was. Um, in what sense did the eternal Son of God become human? What does it mean when we read John 1.14 that the Word became flesh? Mm. And you know, it, it is an interesting question because mm -hmm. if you take it completely literally, the way that we, use, we usually use the word um, become, mm -hmm. right? It would suggest that the eternal Son of God, the Word, stopped being what He was and became something else, became flesh. Yeah, and, and that not, clearly wasn't the case, right, right? right? That's not what that means. Yep. So what did it mean? And one of the ways that, that some theologians thought about this, and this includes a guy named Nestorius who was a monk from Syria who ended up becoming the Bishop of Constantinople, which in, in kind of like uh, our terms today, it would, it would be like being the Bishop of New York City yeah, that's, or, that would be my analogy. or of Washington, D.C., yeah. Right, it wasn't Rome, but it's where all but the political power was. Yeah, all the money and power was in Constantinople. That's right. So he's he's made it. Yeah, you know, in his ecclesial career, he's at the top, and almost top. The stories came from a kind of theological school of thought um, that uh, that read that verse, the word became flesh, and thought that it meant that the word associated himself, uh, bound himself really closely with a human being. Right, and, um, and in a sense, you could think about the way that um, if you read the Old Testament about the prophets, it'll say that the word of the Lord came to, came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet or whoever yeah. it was and kind of indwelt him. And Nestorius, um, that's kind of the way that he thought about the incarnation. That, um, but it wasn't just like in the prophets. It was in this most perfect way. The word kind of did everything in perfect concert with this human being named Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they work together so perfectly that we can think of them as a unit, right? So mm -hmm. uh, Nestorius knew that he had to be able to say with St. Paul, for us there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right, as he says in 1 Corinthians 8. Mm -hmm. um, and nonetheless, it was very important for him that we never confuse the eternal word of God, who is true God, and the humanity, the true man that is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And again, he thought they did everything together, but nonetheless, they had to be kept distinct. Mm -hmm. They had to be kept distinct. Because, you know, God is, well, eternal. He's omnipotent. Uh, he can't suffer, and he certainly can't die. You know, you know um, what kind of God isn't eternal and omnipotent, <laughs> that can suffer and can die? Pagan gods. Yeah. Pagan gods. Mm. Pagan gods can die. Pagan gods can that's kill. That's helpful because he, he, I think that's a helpful note that he's trying to distinguish Jesus as God. Uh, yeah, yeah, as true God, true right? God, right. From, from these the... sort of pagan deities. Mm -hmm. And you know what else pagan gods have is mothers. And so Nestorius actually says this when he understands uh, yeah. that, you know, um, these these people he sees in church who light candles and pray to the mother of God, he understands that they're just being pious, but he thinks it's important, and he's not wrong uh, in this regard, that it's mm -hmm. important to be precise in our doctrine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We've been entrusted with an incredible mystery in the gospel, mm -hmm. and so we need to be responsible with the language mm -hmm. that we use and how we understand the words mm -hmm. that God has given us to talk about this mystery. And he said, look, when you say mother of God, this sounds pagan. Mm. It sounds as if you're, you're sort of, you're actually compromising the true divinity of Christ. That's pretty striking. And I, I, I don't know if, if it's worth talking about Galatians 4, 4 here, but this idea that, you know, when Paul talks about Jesus, he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is such a striking line that Paul just puts it in, in clear terms, that born under a woman. So that, that here we have the Redeemer God, born under... Born you know, of woman. Born yeah. of a woman, right. So now let's go back to, 
you know, I'm hoping you're not convincing. You're, you're doing such a great job of giving Nestorius this case. <laughs> I, I hope you're not making little Nestorians out there. So help, help me from becoming a Nestorian. No, John. this is really give, great, right? Give, and give and I actually answer. think that Paul gives the answer here. And, and what you just read um, actually really sort of tees us up for the response that the church gave to Nestorius, especially through the labors of St. Cyril of Alexandria, mm. uh, who, was, who was the Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, right? Which was, which was actually always seen as uh, the second see in Christendom next to Rome, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and Cyril was, was Nestorius' biggest opponent, and this is exactly the kind of thing he pointed to. And he said, you know, Nestorius, I understand that you want to protect us against paganism. Don't worry about that. I'm not denying uh, that Jesus is true God. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that God in his divinity can suffer, can be a baby, can have a mother. What I'm saying is that w the one who is true God, the person of the word, the person of God's eternal son, mm -hmm. truly assumed to himself our humanity so that everything we can say of humanity, we can say of him, not according to his divinity, right? Mm -hmm. But according to his true humanity. And you can see that right here. If you say, well, Paul, who was it who was born of woman? It's God's son. It's yeah. the son that God sent forth, the son that God so loved the world that he sent him mm -hmm. uh, to suffer and die for us, to be our savior so that we could have eternal life through him, right? Born of woman, born under the law. Why? To redeem those who are under the law. And then this is really important to Cyril so that we might receive adoption as sons. Mm. And how do we receive that adoption as sons? Because we're sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Abba Father. Father. Because you see, for Cyril, the mystery of the gospel is not just mm. having the, the, the price of our, pins, uh, of our sins, sins paid for, yep. right? It's not just getting off the hook. It's not just sort of getting back to, you know, to zero, yeah, right. Being, it's more than being free from sin, is right? What you're saying. Yep. It's being, it's being, um, it's being swept up mm -hmm. into Christ's own eternal sonship, so that we can call God Abba, just as He calls God wow. Abba. There's two amazing things there. One is, and that Nestorius was acute too. That is, that this God takes on human nature and becomes vulnerable mm -hmm. in a way that you wouldn't expect a God to become vulnerable. That's right. That Jesus can suffer pain and ultimately die. That's, a, that's astounding. But then, you know, you think, okay, that, you can't get bigger news than that. But then it's that we can become adopted sons of God. That we, that, yeah. that, and that's exactly why. And this is, this is why the fathers say things like, I mean, St. Irenaeus was, was probably the first that we at least have recorded saying it this directly. Mm -hmm. He says, the son of God became a son of man so that sons of men, human beings, can become sons of God. Wow, that's astonishing. It is, it, 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 I mean, and it's the gospel. And Cyril knew it was astonishing, and he knew that it would break our brains to really, to really take on that mm. God became human so that we can say crazy things like God died and like God has a mother. Well, this is, that leads exactly to, and, and you might want to repeat what you said at the end here, but why, why all the trouble and bother about calling, giving Mary this title, Mother of God? It's controversial, Can, you know, let's just simplify. So what, what do we gain when, um, for the average Christian when we say Mary's the Mother of God? And that's, I, I've obviously you were pointing in that direction at the end of your last answer. Yeah, I mean, and, and, this, and Cyril says this directly in any number of places, um, that if we you know, because Nestorius, he was like, look, I'm a reasonable man. Let's compromise. We'll call, we'll call Mary not Theotokos, which is Greek for God-bearer, and we often translate it Mother of God. We'll call her Christotokos. She's the one who bears the Christ, mm. right? And, and but let's just like leave God out of it, so to speak. And Cyril says, no, that's a compromise that actually is fatal, that it actually mm. compromises the gospel. Wow. Because... He said, look, if you can't say that Mary is the mother of God, if you can't say that the one who was born of her in our humanity is truly God, then he can't communicate divine life to us. Wow. You can't give what you don't have. It doesn't matter how closely God the Word is associated with the man Jesus. If Jesus is not himself mm. the Word of God made flesh, then he can't give us wow. that life that he has with the Father. And that's what the gospel is. Wow. So you're saying then that this is really as much about or more than uh, about Jesus than it is about Mary. That give, giving Mary this title 
is really about saying something about Jesus. Well, okay, so I, I'll say three things. Okay. All right, ready? One, Yeah. yes, it's about Jesus because Jesus is the mm -hmm. author of our salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is our savior. He's the one in whom we believe. He's the one through mm -hmm. whom we have access to the Father, right? And everything ultimately uh, is gonna come back to him um, and through him to the Blessed Trinity, which is the central mystery of our faith, okay? Number two, um, it's about us. Mm -hmm. because it's about our salvation. It's about what mm -hmm. it means to be a Christian. What is this vocation that we're mm -hmm. called to, not only to have the ledger wiped clean on our sins so that God doesn't punish us, but to be welcomed into mm -hmm. his own blessed life. The very beginning of the catechism says this, right? That's why God made us in a plan of sheer goodness to share his own blessed life with us. Mm -hmm. And if we compromise on mother of God, we compromise on our salvation. That's, that's actually why St. John of Damascus, who is an eighth century um, father of the church, he's actually considered in the East the last of the, of the fathers of the church, said that in that one word in Greek, Theotokos, which we translate mother of okay. God, mm -hmm. is hidden the entire mystery of our salvation, mm. okay? But then third, I would say it is about Mary, right? Mm. Think about the dignity mm. that she has as mother of God. If it's really true, Tim, that the person of the word, a member of the blessed Trinity, became human, not just sort of poof out of nowhere, yeah. but born of woman. As we say in the creed, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, ex Maria Virgine in Latin. He truly received his humanity from her. Then that means, and this is unprecedented, this isn't true of anyone else. This means that a divine person is actually dependent on a creature for something that he is. Wow. Not for who he is as God, Right. But for what he is as human, for heaven, he's actually yeah. dependent on Mary. And, and this is why, one of the reasons why, as the mm -hmm. church pondered the mystery of the incarnation over the centuries, mm -hmm. uh, we've come to this deeper and deeper appreciation of the unique dignity of the mother of God. And that's why, um, even though Mary is merely a creature, like any of us, mm -hmm. and compared, I mean, St. Louis de Montfort says, right, I confess with the whole church that Mary is nothing but a creature. Mm -hmm. And that compared to the infinity of God's majesty, mm -hmm. she's like a drop in the ocean. In fact, she's nothing, okay? That's clearly true. And yet in God's gracious plan for our salvation, mm -hmm. he's, called us, he's called her to this dignity. And we recognize that. We don't, we don't treat Mary just like any of the other saints, right? Our older brothers and sisters in the faith. Mm -hmm. She's also our mother in this unique way. Wow. Not just Jesus' mother, but our mother. But our mother. Yeah. I hope so because... I really hope that I'm a member of Christ. Mm. And if I'm a member of Christ, mm. then he gives me a share in all his mysteries, wow. including his birth from the Blessed Mother. That's actually why St. Leo the Great in the fifth century, not that long after the Council of Ephesus, mm -hmm. where Cyril's position was proclaimed dogmatically, Mary was, was said to be mother of God with the certainty of faith. In one of his Christmas sermons, which mm. are really beautiful, he says that the font of baptism uh, is an image of the virgin's womb mm. for every believer who's born there, mm. right? That when we're born again into this life in Christ, we actually are born spiritually of Mary. Wow, that's beautiful. Well, one of our viewers asked, picking up on that thread, why is it important that Mary was a perpetual virgin? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And there are a number of ways in which that's been answered. Um, I think one that is often overlooked um, is simply this, miraculous manifestation of God's grace, right? Mm. Think about the pattern that we see in the Old Testament of these miraculous childbirths, right? Sarah, who was beyond childbearing years. Um, you know, it, the Bible doesn't spend as much time on it as it does with Sarah, but, um, but Rebecca, right, who, who also struggled with childlessness for a long time. Um, uh, Rachel as well, of course, right? The favorite wife of, uh, of Jacob, mm -hmm. uh, who eventually was given uh, Joseph and Benjamin. We can think too of Hannah who prayed for her son Samuel or going back into Judges, right? The wife of Manoah, the mother of Samson. This seems to be a pattern and it's one that's taken up by the prophets to talk not just about the matriarchs, these holy women in Israel's history, mm -hmm. but to talk about Israel herself, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and there's a, cer a certain fittingness, right, to the idea that this would come to it, its culmination in someone uh, who um, not only you know, was sort of childless um, because of, of, um, of barrenness or something like that, of infertility, 
but in fact was a virgin, right? And it's, it's this beautiful testament um, to the utter gratuity mm. of what God has done uh, in, in giving us our Lord Jesus uh, through Mary, right? Um, at another level, uh, the church has always understood virginity in a special way um, as a kind of way of being totally consecrated um, mm -hmm. to God and to his kingdom. Now, that's not a denigration mm -hmm. by any means. Uh, you and I are both married mm -hmm. men. So, exactly. Right? Uh, of the beautiful yeah. sacrament of marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, a sacrament is a sign. Mm -hmm. And a sign points to something else. Mm -hmm. Right? And the sacrament of marriage points to the one supreme marriage, which mm -hmm. is revealed in the last chapters of the Bible, the wedding yeah. feast of the mm -hmm. Lamb with his bride, uh, the church. And in a special way, uh, to consecrate one's virginity uh, to the Lord mm -hmm. um, is to become in a different way a kind of sign. It reminds us mm -hmm. um, that the beautiful gift of matrimony, right, even natural marriage, which was such a wonderful gift, but then our Lord's elevation of it to mm -hmm. the dignity of a sacrament uh, is not an end in itself, right? Um, our marriages, our families um, are wonderful, wonderful gifts from God uh, that, that we're rightly so grateful for, um, but that nonetheless point to something beyond them, mm. right? To, to God's family and to the consummation of that relationship in heaven. I want to ask you, we talk about Mary as mother of God, which is a big title. Mm -hmm. There's a big title given to another woman in the Old Testament at the very beginning of the Old Testament. So Mary is here at the beginning of the New Testament and you have Eve, which will be the mother of the living, right? She's going to be, you know, the first mother who will, with Adam, uh, will be the mother of the human race. And so, there's a lot of connections, and I know that with your patristic work, it seems that the church fathers are, gravitate to this comparison between Eve and Mary. Why, why are the early church fathers, these early readers of the Bible and of Catholic faith, so drawn to this comparison and contrast with Mary and Eve? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question, Tim. You know, um, the Gospels themselves give hints that mm. we should um, see Mary in relation to Eve uh, I think we especially see this, for example, in John's Gospel. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the biblical writers nowhere come out and tell us mm -hmm. that Mary is the new Eve. That's not true with Jesus as the new Adam, right? St. Paul, both in Romans 5 and in 1 Corinthians 15, mm -hmm. uh, is quite clear about Jesus as the second Adam or the last Adam, right? And so there's this sense that in the coming of Christ, it's not just the climax of salvation history, it's also what St. Irenaeus, uh, yeah. one of my favorite early church fathers, refers to as recapitulation. Yeah, right? Explain it, what that a, big word means for yeah, people. So. Well, it means a lot of things, right? Um, it's a kind of, what, it's a, it's a summing up, summing a redemptive do-over almost, yeah. Yeah. Um, a fulfilling mm -hmm. of, of the entire history mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the human race in relation to mm -hmm. God before that. Um, and that, that goes all the way back to our creation, right? That, that Jesus brings about in us, as, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, a new creation, mm -hmm. right? The old is gone, the new has come. Well, what's the role of the woman there, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, even without any of the biblical authors coming out and telling us this, um, the early church fathers apparently very spontaneously and very early began reading Luke chapter 1, and the story of the Annunciation in relation to Genesis 3, right? So think about it. Just as the virgin Eve listened to the voice of the serpent, uh, the serpent yep. and trust for God died in her heart, yep. so that's the like, virgin Mary listened to the voice of the angel. Yeah. A good angel, so bad good angel an versus good angel. Yeah, bad angel versus level. good angel, right? Mm -hmm. And then through hearing that word, she exercised her faith in God. She trusted God's word, right? What does Elizabeth say? Blessed is she who believed, believed what was spoken to her that what was spoken from the Lord would find fulfillment, right? Um, and so um, this relationship between the two uh, was something that you find already being discussed in the second century, wow. right? Very, very early. One of the most beautiful lines about this is something that the Holy Father actually has reminded us of. He recently made St. Irenaeus a doctor that's of the church, church right. much to my joy. Yeah. Um, but long before that, Pope Francis talked about uh, devotion to Our Lady, mm -hmm. untire of knots. Mm -hmm. And this, is a, this goes back to a line uh, in St. Irenaeus where he says that mm -hmm. um, the Virgin Eve tied a knot Hmm. through her disobedience. And that's a knot wow. that we've all sort of inherited, right? Mm -hmm. She's mother of the living, and yet we're all born with this original sin. We're born with this, this, this fragmentation within us, this, mm -hmm. this disruption 
of our communion with God, with one another, and even within ourselves, so that St. Paul says in Romans 7, mm. I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I, what I don't want to do, and mm -hmm. we have that knot. Mm. And Irenaeus says that, um, that the good. knot that Eve tied through her disobedience, Mary untied through her faith, mm. right? And, um, and, and that's the basis, actually, for this devotion, uh, which, which, by the way, I, if anyone hasn't looked into this, I highly recommend it. The Novena to Mary Untire of Knots. Mm. Um, I've seen it work miracles in, wow. in my life, in my marriage, in the lives of, of dear friends. Um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful devotion. I love the contrast you draw between Eve and Mary. Mary's faith, <clears throat> which unties the knot, and Mary's doubt, her distrust, really. Eve's doubt. It, I'm sorry, Eve's, Eve's doubt, yes, in Eve's distrust for God. Because in, in paragraph 397 of the Catechism, it talks about how, you know, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, tempted by the devil, let their trust in their Creator die in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And Mary's trust is her fiat, you know, be it done to me according to thy word. And she believes, she has mm -hmm. faith. And that, that's quite a, quite a sharp contrast. So when we talk about Mary's faith as, as mother of God, and uh, what, what, are the, how, how do we, what are some of the practical lessons that we can bring into our lives for the viewers as we reflect on this great mystery of Mary as the mother of God? Well, you know, it's an astonishing thing um, that, that when God determined um, to send his son, that he wanted to do it, not just born of, of a woman, but that, that that birth would take place through her faith, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that um, it wouldn't be something just without her consent, and it's, but it's not, it's not, I mean, consent, we, we talk about that a lot when we talk about Mary consenting to be mother of God. I don't think it goes deep enough, right? Mm. Elizabeth doesn't say, blessed is she who consented, right? I'm not denying that, it's totally yep. true, yep. but it's something deeper. It's blessed is she who believed God's word, word. that at the end of the day, what mm. all this is about is being able to say, Abba, Father, to ha mm. having that filial trust in, mm. in the Lord, that is ultimately mm. a reflection of the eternal glorification that the Son gives to the Father, the eternal rejoicing in the communion of the Trinity, one that, that gives itself perfectly mm. without holding anything back. Tim, that's not a safe thing to do in a fallen world. Mm. It's not a safe thing to do unless, right, mm. unless we're giving ourselves fully to God. And that's what Mary shows us how to do. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a big takeaway for everybody here. You know, if, if you struggle with trust in God, um, Mary becomes the model. And if we don't trust in God, we end up with a lot of knots, like mm -hmm. Eve, right? That's, that's, the, uh, that's one of the takeaways. What, what's the final thoughts, you know, for everybody on, this is a big title to call Mary Mother of God, but there's a big reality behind that. And uh, it's that, you know, Jesus is truly God, yeah. And we're called to be sons of God as well, right? By no, that's, faith. that's right. Um, yeah, and I guess that, that is my takeaway, that mm. when we call Mary Mother of God, here's what it means. Mm. First Timothy 2.5 says that there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, yeah. right? And maybe we could think of that as, as Jesus sort of standing between us and God, making mm -hmm. us right with him mm -hmm. in the sense of protecting us from his punishment, mm -hmm. and God sort of smiling on us. When we call Mary the mother of God and realize that this mediator, the man Christ Jesus, is himself God and enjoys perfect intimacy, intimacy with the Father, we realize the greatness of wow. what it is that he calls us to. I love that. You know, when you discover Mary as the mother of God, you're discovering the greatness of God's plan for Mary and for all of us. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing, John. Thank you for sharing these insights. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching, especially for everybody who supports us through the Mission Circle. Uh, all of you who are our supporters, we're deeply grateful you allow us to have this ministry and to share the Word of God with others. And uh, that's what's happening all over the world. It's amazing. Formed is reaching over a million and a half people, and, and it's really thanks to all of your support. So I wish that the Lord may bless you and keep you, and thank you for joining us tonight. God bless.